My guest today is Chris DeMars. Chris, how are we doing? Oh, hey, fist bump. Up, oh, COVID doing? fist bump. There we go. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm doing great. You just gave a talk at Code Match, didn't you? I did. I just gave one of my many accessibility talks. You're the ex- accessibility guy. I am. The, I am the person. Yeah. 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 I did a uh, a four hour workshop on Tuesday and then talked today. Very cool. Accessibility is important, but I think a lot of people don't know what it is. Define it. So, to me, web accessibility is building out those experiences so everybody can use the web like it's it's, sometimes it's defined as people with disabilities can Mm -hmm. just use the web but it's not just people with disabilities Hmm. it's everybody everybody should be able to have the same amazing accessible user experience regardless if they have a disability or not okay so i guess uh let's go into that a little further because i i don't have a disability that prevents me from using the web and so sometimes i fall into that trap i think all my users are like me right and then i I'll flip around and say, well, yeah, what about blind people? What about yeah. uh, deaf people? Yeah. But you're saying it's more than that. Who else it is, is that? It's very much more than that. A lot of the times, depending on who you talk to, it's either you're blind or you're deaf, and that's a disability. Yeah. It's, it's not just black and white. There's very you know, there's a lot of gray area. You have a, different people with different types of vision disabilities, like okay, color so, blindness. So maybe I'm not blind, but I have a degraded Right, and you, division. your assistive technology is your glasses. Right. You take them off, it might be hard for you to see. It is hard for me. Yeah, there so you I go. Guess so you have a little disabled. bit of an impairment or some type of little bit of a disability. But then you have def- not just deaf when it's into the, the context of hearing, right? You have some people that have partial deafness in one ear or maybe right. one ear is deaf and the other they can hear out of. You have cognitive disabilities, okay. math comprehension, reading comprehension, autism. Hmm. You have mobility disabilities like cerebral palsy and arthritis and sure. MS, right? Yeah. And then you have those temporary impairments, which I don't really consider them disabilities. Broken hand, broken arm, broken finger, right? But you also have to think about the disabilities we don't outright show to people, the hidden ones, hmm. right? I have debilitating and diagnosed health anxiety. Okay. Just looking at me, you wouldn't be able to tell. Right. Because I can, I'm ably able to do things. Yeah. But when the anxiety is too much and I spend my time checking myself and doing my obsessive disorder my compulsions right now i'm losing time doing other things so it's definitely an impairment that i struggle with all the time but usually a lot of people don't think about all of those things that's fair I know unless you're I like in been. the accessibility space yeah so if i'm a web developer yeah uh, this is a broad question but yeah. how do i address at least some of those issues Doing research for sure, getting educated on that, going to conferences, being a part of the community. And if you can't do that, just Google stuff like mm-hmm. web accessibility. Just Google web accessibility. There's so much information out there about web accessibility. And then just learning the different tools you can use to audit your experiences. You can audit these things, automate it, of course. It'll catch so many errors. Okay. And you can see what they are, where they are, and you can start learning a little bit more about how to approach these access- these experiences to make them accessible. Okay, so let's be more specific. Yeah. Well, let's say uh, I want to make it more accessible to people with vision impairment. Yeah. What specifically can I do to make being my Being cognizant of font sizes, being cognizant of font choices, font family choices, making sure that your color contrast works. Um, contrast sensitivity is really big, and it's one of those things I call a low-hanging fruit. Uh, the talk I just gave is about common accessibility pitfalls or what I call low-hanging fruit, and contrast is one of those, making sure the colors work, foreground and background. Right. You know, you don't want to have a light gray text on a white background. Like almost every site I go to does right. these days. Right, but the funny <laughs> thing about that is it will fail an audit, but if you bump the font size up, it'll pass an audit. Okay. Because now it's in your face and you can actually see it. I sometimes end up doing that. Yeah, but the contrast will still suck. <laughs> right. You know, but, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, let's, uh, and then there are things that um, uh, that are not immediately visible, like, yeah. like um, I don't know, alt tags, for example. Right? Yep. So when images and alt attributes are a huge thing that I talk about, um, you need alt text within the alt attribute to describe what the image is, mm-hmm. right? And you don't want to write a paragraph, but you also don't need a, like, a one word is not going to cut it either. Like, my dog, you know, that brings okay. us up in my talks. What kind of dog do you right. have? Or my car, what kind of car is it? Is it a 6.4 Chevy Impala? Or is it like a Chevy Silverado? I'm a Chevy person, so okay. I love my GM I, My vehicles. first car was a Nova. There you go. <laughs> but, like, you have to have that in there because if the image is broken or it's not there at all or the, it's not getting served, the user needs to be able to know what content that was there unless it's a decorative image. If it doesn't provide content, or con- if it doesn't provide content to the context of the experience, yep. the decorative image doesn't need alternative text. Okay. 
but the alt attribute still needs to be there. And what? that's because if it's if not, it'll you'll get dinged in an accessibility audit. Oh, okay. Because those automated tools are looking for the alt attribute that follows an image tag. So an alt image equal, equals blank string, an empty string? Yeah, you can do an empty string, okay. and that'll pass if it's for a decorative image, but Got then it. that's also up to the author that's making that content, whether or not they want the alt text to be there, or they don't. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what uh, I'm, I'm curious about, um, if I have uh, an injured hand, or I don't have a hand, yeah. uh, how can I make my... That making my sure that, that your focus, all your focus is there. Making sure that you don't remove focus from that experience. Because okay. if you remove focus for one person, you're going to remove it for everybody that's trying to use that experience. What do you right? mean by focus? Uh, the focus is the focus ring that you get around buttons and inputs okay. yeah. that lets you know you're interacting with that piece of the UI. Okay. The issue is if you remove that, and a lot of times you see where companies or stakeholders or designer marketing, they say, remove the focus ring. We don't want that. It looks gross because it's either black or not black, but it's either blue or gray, hmm. right? And depending on what browser you're in, that can be different because it's hmm. based on how the user agent is pushing the focus out. Hmm. You can remove the focus, but make sure that you always add it back in if you need to match your branding, but hmm. never just remove it and, never, and just leave it. Um, so that lets you interact with it. But if, if you're using the keyboard and you're tabbing through this experience, you can see where you are and that, you know, based on the DOM and how you're moving through it. And if you're using a screen reader, that will announce to you element has focus or focus element. Element has focus, and it'll give you instructions on how to interact. Uh, I see. So you're talking about people that can't, if I, if I have a bad arm or no arm, that I can't use the mouse and I'm only restricted right. to the keyboard. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, let's talk about some of these lists of uh, potential disabilities, like yeah. uh, like a hearing impairment. Is that it, is it is it harder to interact with the web page? It uh, is. So it's a is. visual medium, right? Especially if you have sound, you have video, you have anything that's verbal. If you are not providing captions or some type of transcription service, your users not going to be able to use your experience. I worked with a developer uh, at a company once, and she was actually deaf in one ear. And her problem with stuff on the web was stuff that didn't, like video that didn't have captioning. Captioning right. is important, yeah. But, I mean, that works with sign language, too. Like, you can add sign language mm -hmm. uh, or somebody doing it. But, I mean, it, it's very resource intensive. By resource, I don't mean people. I mean money, right? But those that's when you start getting into conformance levels of yeah. accessibility. And, but as long as, like, there's captions and transcripts, you're still trying to hit that true north of being accessible to your users. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of automated tools which will generate captions. Yeah. They're not perfect, but they're right. usually better than nothing. Yep. YouTube, for example. Yep, and that's what I, that I when I show YouTube videos in my talk, I make sure I hit closed caption on it yeah. so it can display the captions for everybody. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, I, here's one we don't really think about very much. You talked about cognitive disabilities and yeah. making sure the web is accessible to yeah. folks with cognitive disabilities. Talk about that. Uh, the one thing I do like talking about when it comes to cognitive disabilities is language making sure that the language makes sense to anybody, right? Because you might interpret language one way than somebody with dyslexia might interpret it because things might be jumbled up for them. Oh, can you give me an example? Um, using like technical jargon that is like very long or stuff that might not be universal uh, for okay. others, All right. that's when language is a big part of UX, but it's also a big part of accessibility. Um, another example I talk about a lot is font choices. Because dyslexic users, like, nobody likes using Comic Sans, right? We know that. Well, but dyslexic users... I do. Oh, of course you do. <laughs> but no, uh, dyslexic users um, tend to gravitate more towards font faces and font families that are uh, on an italic kind of basis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more easily able... They're more easily able to read that kind of font hmm. if it has, like, a slight wave to it or, like, a slight italicized slant to it okay. opposed to letters that are straight up and down. Okay, so, so yeah. Comic Sans does have a bit of a wiggle to right. it. Right, and that's, that's one of the fonts that is great for people with um, dyslexia. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm going to change all my there you fonts go. to change Comic Sans. <laughs> uh, you mentioned tools. Yeah that uh, these are to test whether or not your yep. site is accessible. Talk about those a bit. So one, one tool I use a lot is um, called Axe. You can install it in your CI/CD pipeline. It's Axe Core. Okay. Uh, you can install it as a, an extension for Firefox and Chrome. You can also install an extension for Edge because Edge is Chromium-based okay. now. And it will run an accessibility audit on a page-by-page -page basis if you're using the non-pro version in the browser uh, with the extension. Hmm. And Axe is a tool made by DQ. Non-pro non means free. Right, yeah, like non-pro means free. And it's made by a company in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, <laughs> called DQ. Great. Not Dairy Queen. <laughs> Don't get that. I always have to say that. 
But uh, it's an amazing tool, and it will catch, depending on who you talk to, it'll catch, tw I think it catches 20 to 50% of all automated accessibility errors. Okay. The only way you're going to try to get a hold of everything is not only by the automated, but also doing the manual testing. Okay. Screen reader, not using the mouse, just using the keyboard, doing checking the color contrast with simulators. Uh, that tool I use a lot. And then I'm a big, a big um, user of Lighthouse and Chrome's DevTools. What does that do? So Lighthouse will also run an accessibility audit. It will give you a score out of 100. Uh, depending on who you talk to, that score doesn't matter. I think it's a good just you know, to, to see where you're at in that experience so, and how, right, you're in the and how, exactly, and how, how well you're getting better with that. Okay. Um, but Lighthouse actually uses Axe Core under the hood. Oh, so if you use that, maybe you don't, you need Axe? So the thing about that is, is that depending on what browser version you have, one might be more off than the other because the Axe extension could be updated, but if it's higher than the version of Lighthouse and Chrome that you're using, one might show other errors than the other one does. So you always want to make sure that okay. if you're using them side by side, they're in sync. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, by default, Chrome is always the most recent version unless you You would think, some, but not always because at some enterprise companies, you're, you're not allowed to upgrade your machine. The browser versions are restricted. Yeah, so it's no longer evergreen in those places. Right. So now you might be back three versions okay. when everybody else is supporting the, the latest stable version. Right. And I've been at places that have done that. Sure. So. Interesting. Um, is what haven't we talked about that we should have? Um, I don't know. What are you doing? Let's let's flip the tables. What are you doing? Uh, well, I'm not week? doing a lot of UX stuff, so uh, yeah. I'm doing a lot of back end things, yeah. data, yeah. working with Azure Data Explorer. So nice. I don't think that uh, uh, what I'm building has a uh, an impact yet mm -hmm. on the, the the user experience. Yeah, uh, there 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 will be a front end eventually. Right. Maybe I'll build that. Yeah. Oh, that'd be <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, oh, well, that's a good question. So if, if, I, if I'm building back-end or middleware tools, yeah. do I need to care about accessibility? You should. You know, in my opinion, if you have your hand in any type of web or software application, you should care. And mm -hmm. that goes from the designer all the way up to you know, the VP or the product owner. Like, you should care about accessibility mm -hmm. because you have a hand in it. Like, the stuff you're making should be accessible, you know, paired with the UI. It needs to be accessible for everybody. So, yeah, I think, I believe everybody should care. Yeah. Uh, how did you become so passionate about this and become That's the guy? That's a great question. That's a really, really great question. I started building on the web many, many moons ago. I was, I was a young, young Chris, young Demars, just working <laughs> on the web. And uh, accessibility wasn't like a huge thing, like in the mid to late 90s. Okay. Um, when I was started to get back into the world of the web, um, trying to find a job, and I, you know, I went back to school after dropping out, I wasn't really in tune with web accessibility until I saw... Marcy Sutton give a talk on accessibility. Mm -hmm. And Marcy is, she's, she's awesome. And I was like, oh wow, like this matters. Like the stuff she was talking about, I never thought about before. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I should really start talking about this because I don't see anybody talking about it. Yeah. And she was the one that kind of pushed me in that direction to speak about accessibility. And then my mom, she has multiple disabilities and mm. she, she still has a flip phone. So, but like <laughs> as moms do, right? As moms do, you know, she's she's a boomer. She's going to be sixty six this year, a two time cancer survivor. Oh, and good, good for if, her. If if she were to use technology, I would want to make sure that she's using something that's accessible, especially if I built it. Yeah. So she's kind of my why as to behind it. That personalizes well. it for you, and it humanizes it, and it makes yeah. you think like, oh wow, like there might be somebody in my life that I never thought about. Yeah. And that might make you actually care about accessibility when you leave my talks. Outstanding. Uh, when are you speaking next? Oh, I am going to be, uh, well, I was supposed to be next week. I was supposed to fly yeah, to Texas. But it's not, oh, the, that conference that got postponed conference. to the summer. Which one? That one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I was supposed to fly to Texas next week, um, but I think the next one coming up is Dev Nexus in April in Atlanta. Okay, I've not been to that one. Yeah, it's a really, really good one. It's usually a Java event, but in recent years, they started adding web tracks. Excellent. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's where I'll be. I'll be at CodeStock. Uh, I think that's just DevNexus and CodeStock for right now. So, Chris, thanks so much for your time. I learned a lot. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, next time we do this, we're going to maybe have some soda pops, talk about more technology, and hang with our friends. I like it a lot. <laughs>